Let's just sit for a moment with the last words of that anthem, that Wendell Berry poem. For a while I rest in the grace of the world and am free. For this sacred time together, may we indeed rest in that gracious freedom. I'm really delighted this semester to be teaching a class over at the Divinity School. The class is called Meaning Making, Theological Reflection on Ministry. And it's a class where students doing internships or field education can gather to reflect theologically on their practice of ministry. But to get signed up to teach this year, I had to fill out a, a ton of paperwork, right? And among the documents I received during my onboarding was a list of the many generous benefits that, that Harvard offers its employees and, and faculty. Now, as a very part-time adjunct, I'm not really eligible for most of those. But one, nonetheless, one that caught my attention was that Harvard offers its employees free access to an app for your phone. It's a popular app called 10% Happier. Have any, of you, have any of you heard of it? Yeah, some of you know it. 10% Happier, I guess it's a podcast as well. And 10% Happier bills itself as you know a wellness app. But from what I can see, it's, it's actually more of a religion app, right? It's, or at least a spirituality app because it offers lessons in meditation and, and mindfulness and, and gratitude and other spiritual practices that the app suggests will, will make us happier by at least 10%, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and at first I thought, gosh, that's kind of a modest claim, 10%. <laughs> But then I realized I would be like, you know, I'd be so grateful to be just 10% happier, right? Wouldn't you? I mean, who, who wouldn't be? Um, happiness is one of life's great blessings. So, you know, so bring it on. And, and more and more I see religious and spiritual leaders holding out to their followers the promise of, of happiness, or even sometimes financial abundance as a result of religious practice. Come to think of it, we could make a similar claim for the church. Uh, numerous studies have shown that people who go to church are happier than those who don't. Uh, a recent Gallup poll revealed that 67% of folks who go to church regularly reported being very satisfied with their lives compared to 48% satisfaction for those who don't go to church. That's a difference of 19%. <laughs> we could start an app called 19% Happier. You know? I wish I'd thought of that sooner, you know? In all seriousness, though, I can think of a lot of reasons why church going might truly make us happier. At, at church, we're part of a caring and supportive community. We can work with others to make the world a better place and wrestle with important questions in our lives, questions about life's meaning and purpose. These things can and sometimes do foster happiness and, and well-being, and that's a wonderful thing. And, not but, but and, <laughs> And I wonder if we don't sell religion short. If we don't sell ourselves short, our, sell our souls short, when we lift up happiness as somehow the purpose or goal of religious practice, spiritual practice. Yes, happiness may sometimes be a fortunate corollary to religious practice, but is it the goal? We want to be happy, 
But is it what our souls most long for? Or is there something more than happiness? Because for one thing, religious practice can just as easily make us unhappy. It can open our hearts and make us more sensitive to the pain and and injustice and cruelty of the world. Or it can foster in us a prophetic rage that doesn't always make room for happiness. But mostly, I wonder whether happiness is up to the task of healing what most ails my soul. Look, you heard the joys and sorrows this morning. We live in difficult times when loneliness, pain, suffering, and despair always seem to be creeping round the window. Fear for the future of our nation, our our, our planet. Fear for the well-being of the people we love and the the causes that we we cherish. This morning, the choir echoed the words of Wendell Berry, when despair for the world grows in me and I wake at night with the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. In that moment... Is it happiness that we seek? For me, the answer is no. For me, happiness can't penetrate that dark night. But if there was something that could, If there were something that could salve our despairing hearts, something that could revive our spirits when all seems lost, if there were that something, then I'd want to know about it and experience it and make it the object of my religious desire and devotion. Friends, I once endured a great trial in my life when for a long time my soul was cast down. I was heartsick. And the thing about it was that, that my sadness, my grief, my, my despair felt impervious to the many pleasures that normally made me happy cooking dinner for my family, going out for a drink after work with friends, curling up with a good book, just just spending quiet time with my husband and son. None of these seemed to break through the fog of my grief and sadness. It was a lonely and isolating time. Maybe you've known such a time. And I remember... One day in late winter, February, I think, there was snow on the ground. The trees were bare and the skies gray, and I was sitting at the desk in my second floor study at home trying to write a sermon. Imagine having to find something helpful and hopeful to say to a whole group of people when all you feel is a profound sadness. So there I was, staring out the window in the bleak midwinter, when a single male cardinal alighted on a branch just outside my window. And what can I say? Against the gray landscape, he seemed the brightest, reddest, most beautiful cardinal I'd ever seen. And he was so close, if the window weren't there, I could have reached out and touched him. I felt my heart quicken with delight. Tears filled my eyes and a smile came to my face. I felt profound gratitude for this little glimpse of beauty amidst the darkness that I was experiencing. No sooner had he landed on the branch than he was off again, but I felt changed. I felt called back to the land of the living. 
And it feels a little risky to share a story like this, honestly, because after all, it was just a cardinal. <laughs> and words often fail us when we try to describe epiphanies like this one, right? But I share it because I'm guessing that most of us, most of us have experienced something like this too. And at the risk of diminishing the experience by giving it a label, I'm going to go ahead and for now call this an experience of awe. That's the name that, you know, mystics and prophets from so many traditions have given to experiences like this one. Awe. What is awe and how does it differ from happiness? For me, Awe is the experience of having our mundane lives and common material world around us suddenly and surprisingly revealed to us as something larger, more meaningful, more mysterious, I'll say it, more holy than we had previously imagined. One of the great theologians of awe, here we are in the days of, in the midst of the Jewish days of awe, was the rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, the great civil rights leader and friend of Dr. King. Throughout his life, Heschel tried to cultivate a posture of what he called radical amazement before the world. Awe, he said, is the realization that things not only are what they are, but also stand, however remotely, for something supreme, transcendent. Awe, he continued, enables us to sense in small things, small like a little red bird, the beginning of infinite significance, to sense the ultimate in the common, to feel in the rush of our busy lives the stillness of the eternal. Have you ever experienced this? For me, a world without awe is hardly worth living, is dull and reductive, a world that ceases to bring pleasure or joy. To quote another of my favorite theologians, we are living in a material world, okay? <laughs> we are living in a material world, and with apologies to Madonna, I am not a material <laughs> guy. <laughs> I'm a spiritual guy, right? Not that it's a binary. <laughs> but when I look out and survey the material world, the world of matter, I often see mystery there too, right? There is mystery among the matter. And once perceived, this mystery reveals the world to be more precious and interconnected and sacred than I'd otherwise thought it to be. And the sudden and often unexpected apprehension of this mystery is what we call awe. Awe is the re-enchantment of our world. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons I'm grateful to be a Unitarian Universalist is that our transcendentalist ancestors, Emerson, Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, they taught me, they teach us, that the holy isn't just locked up in some ancient scripture somewhere, but the sacred is all around us. The world is literally shot through with the holy. Thanks be to God. The, appar the apprehension of this truth has made all the difference in my life. And you know, it's not just that awe has this power to, to gobsmack us and blow our minds open and set us crying at the sight of a cardinal. 
There's something else about awe. Awe does have the power to call us back to life. Back to life's beauty and goodness. When my heart is closed, when my soul is cast down, it's awe, not happiness, that revives me. Once, when giving thanks to God, Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote, God, I asked you for wonders instead of happiness, and you gave them to me. The feeling that awe inspires can sometimes be mistaken for happiness, but a better word for it might be joy or gratitude. The Benedictine brother David Stendhal Rast describes this grateful joy as, quote, happiness that doesn't depend on what happens. Happiness that doesn't depend on what happens. Happiness can be contingent, right? But we can experience awe even in the midst of hardship and struggle and pain. If we cultivate a posture of amazement before the world, if we keep looking for mystery among the matter, Friends, eventually, happiness comes home to us like a lost dog. It always does. And once again, our life is content with its pleasures. But when despair for the world grows in you, and you wake in the night in fear of what your life and your child's life may be, then my prayer is that you will be met with a wonder that calls you back to life. For a while I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Amen. Should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows fall? Why should my heart ever be lonely and long for heaven and home? When a Jesus is my portion A constant friend is he His eyes on the sparrow And I know he watches me His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. I, I sing because I'm happy every day I sing. 